there's a more convenient way of constructing a anti-symmetric linear combination and this is very useful if you have more than two electrons. You can write what's called a Slater determinant. Okay, so that expression we wrote earlier can be written like this. There's one over square root of two right there. Um, that's two factorial. To make it more generic later when we have more than two electrons, you're going to need to put a factorial term there. I'm sorry? Yes, the factorial is inside the square root. Because we'll, we'll get to it when we have more than two electrons, then that factorial becomes uh, significant. Because two factorial is the same thing as two, two times one. All right, so you have, how do you, can, how do you evaluate a two by two determinant? This times that, right? So one S1, alpha one, 1s2, beta 2. So when you write that one, that's 1s1, alpha 1, 1s2, beta 2. So that's electron 1 spin up, electron 2 spin down. Minus this times that. So that's 1s1, beta 1. This is electron 1 spin down. This is electron 2 spin up. So minus 1s1, beta 1, 1s2, alpha 2. Okay. So how do you construct a Slater determinant in general? Uh, what you do is this. If you have n electrons, okay, so you're going to assign it to n spin orbitals. Each one of these functions is a spin orbital. What's a spin orbital? Like this one. This is a spin orbital. You have electron 1 spin up and the 1s orbital spin up. So each term in your Slater determinant is a spin orbit. It's a, it's a function that describes the orbital and the spin of one electron. So the way you construct your Slater determinant is this. In column one, okay, you'll notice it's all F1. Okay, so that's, <coughs> yeah, have a spin orbital for electron 1, electron 2, electron 3, all the way to electron n. So each column, the variable for each column is the electron number. So electron 1, electron 2, electron 3, and so on. And this is spin orbital 1, spin orbital 2. So this is like 1s, 1s, 2, 1s alpha, 1s beta, 2s alpha, 2s beta, and so on. All right. So column one would be spin orbital number one, column two would be spin orbital number two. Row one, you'd have everything in row one would be functions of electron one, everything in row two would be functions of electron two and so on, right? If you were to expand this determinant, okay, an n by n determinant, if you were to expand it, you are going to get n factorial terms. Okay, right, right, this one right here, we expand this, we get two terms, this one, this one. That just gives you actually the number of permutations. It's really a question of assigning electrons to the different spin orbitals. So you have to look at all the possible ways of assigning the electrons to the spin orbitals. So the number of permutations, okay, n things taken n at a time would be n factorial. So you're going to have, when you expand a... Uh, and n by n determinant, you're going to get n factorial terms. So this is 1 over square root of n factorial here is your normalization constant. The probability that each one of those is going to happen is just 1 over n factorial, the square of this coefficient. Okay, so if you have like, let's say you have a 3 by 3 determinant, what would you have? If you expand it, how many terms are you going to get? 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1. You have a 3 by 3 determinant, you're going to get 6 terms, right? So each one of those terms has a 1 sixth probability. Okay, so your coefficient is going to be 1 over square root of 6 because the probability is the square of the coefficient. Okay. So there are n factorial ways of distributing n electrons to n spin orbitals. Each one of these ways corresponds to one product of spin orbital. For example, one way would be, like if you multiply all of these, 
Okay, so you say electron 1 is in spin orbital f1, electron 2 is in spin orbital f2, electron 3 is in spin orbital f3, all the way to electron n is in spin orbital fn. That's one of the n factorial ways. That, so that's one of the n factorial terms you get when you expand out the determinant. Okay? Uh, let me see if I can quickly give you an example. I don't know if MathCat will do it. But, uh, let me see. Let me make a determinant here. Um, matrix toolbar, determinant. And let me put a matrix in there. Let me put a 3 by 3 matrix. Okay. So I'm going to say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. Let's expand that determinant. Let me see if the, I can get it to expand. Oh, it's using E as a, uh, okay, let me use different letters here. So let's call this A1, A2, uh, let's call this B1, C1, oops, and let's call this A2, B2, okay. C2, let's call this A3, B3, C3. Look, okay? Think of A, B, and C as your spin orbitals, and 1, 2, and 3 as your electron. Electron 1, electron 2, and electron 3. Okay? So 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Six terms. Okay, so electron 1 is in spin orbital A, electron 2 is in spin orbital B, electron 3 is in spin orbital C. Okay, what happened when we went from, uh, let's compare these two, what happened here? Electron 2 is now in spin orbital C and electron 3 is now, so that would be the switch right here, right? So you switch B and C, right? Now, every time you make a switch, to make things anti-symmetric, you have to put a negative sign on the switch term. And that's automatically done when you set things up as a, later, as a determinant. Okay, and that, that's the reason why we can use a Slater determinant to uh, construct an anti-symmetric linear combination. Okay, so now, what, so that's this one. So A, B2 times C3, and then C2, B3, multiplied by A1. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six different ways of assigning three electrons to three spin orbitals. Okay. So it's like, think of it this way. You've got three seats, okay, A, B, and C, and you have three people, person one, two, and three. How many ways can you assign three people to three houses? Six ways. Three times two times one. Okay. What if we did a five by five determinant? Let's see. Let me do a five by five. Five by five. Uh, let's make it four by four. Okay. So I'm going to call this A1, B1, C1, B1, A2, B2, C2, B, B2, A3, B3, C3, B3, A4, B4, C4, B4. How many terms do I have here? 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Oops. Ah, <laughs> lost count. But you're going to have four factorial terms, right? And that's 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. There's 24 ways of distributing 4 electrons to 4 spin orbitals. Assigning 4 electrons to 4 spin orbitals, okay? So, um, that's, uh, that's how you can construct a Slater determinant. So you don't have to write all of those 24 terms out. You just set it up as a determinant. It's a compact way of representing that whole lengthy function. Now, a Slater determinant automatically, because of the way determinants are evaluated or expanded, is anti-symmetric with respect to exchange of any two electrons. Why is that? If I were to call all of these first row elements here, instead of one here, I make this a two. And if I were to change all of these twos into ones, okay, I'm exchanging labels for electron 1 and electron 2. But essentially, what have I done? I've switched two rows in my determinant. Anytime you switch rows in your determinant or switch columns in your determinant, you just get the negative of the original determinant. Let's illustrate that quickly with a simple example. Let's say you have a 2 by 2 determinant, OK? Uh, so if I have a determinant here and I put a 2 by 2 matrix, okay, let's try 1, 2, 3, 4. What's that determinant equal to? That's 1 times 4 minus 3 times 2, right? That's negative 2, okay? 1 times 4 minus 3 times 2 is negative 2. What would happen if I were to switch two rows? This time I'm going to put 3 and 4 up here. And 1 and 2 down here. That's going to be 6 minus 4, right? So anytime you switch two rows in your determinant, you get the negative of the original determinant. So automatically, just because of the way a determinant is defined, by setting up your function as a Slater determinant, you're guaranteeing that what you're writing down is an anti-symmetric linear combination. 